So picking up where we left off yesterday, we were going to talk about England and how they are going to uniquely challenge this uh, shift towards absolutism and uh, the divine right of kings. So Europe's going to struggle with that here in the West. Uh, in France, uh, I'll fix this map in a bit, uh, France, the German areas, I mean, pretty much every area is going to deal with some sort of in Spain, some sort of uh, uh, rise of these centralized, increasingly absolutist monarchs. Uh, and the way they control things, they just like we talked about the other day, um, how it just, they kind of do whatever they want and you have to listen to them uh, because they have this divine authority or absolute authority. <clears throat> and in the 14 and 1500s, they were actually powerful enough to do that with their increasingly uh, centralized tax schemes and uh, use of military uh, professional armies that are loyal to them. Uh, they were able to do that. Uh, but ironically enough, in England, even though that's kind of where it originates, uh, more or less, that's also gonna be where it's gonna be resisted and um, pretty much, I don't wanna say destroyed, but certainly uh, diminished uh, in England compared to the other places. The other places are gonna resist monarchs absorbing power. They'll do it in France with the Fronde, and uh, in, uh, in Spain with the Catalan revolts, and there's you know Polish nobles, all, all sorts of nobility across the realm that resist monarchs increasingly becoming powerful. Uh, so it's not a, not a trend that just, you know, sets in across Europe without, without any sort of uh, recourse, but uh, the English are gonna lead the most successful campaign against um, the, the monarchs. Uh, and the reason why this is relevant is because, and the reason why I explain this whole feudal thing is, um, the seeds <clears throat> of English government in the feudal era, uh, when, when feudal, feudalism was dominant, but those are actually gonna be the, the tools and mechanisms they use to resist the monarch successfully. Uh, and then of course, that's going to uh, totally change the system in the West uh, to a different form of constitutional government uh, with limits and rights on the government, the monarch in England. But that's going to bleed over into our uh, government here in the United States. So that's why we're going through this big elaborate process. Uh, so not only do I want you to understand why it is the way it is, but <clears throat> to understand that we've, it's a historical process of, of finding better uh, routes and alternatives. Um, you know, going this way, that doesn't work, and we go this way, it doesn't work, and we, we're, we're trying to find some sort of middle ground or new approach that does. Uh, so it helps us kind of appreciate what we have uh, and know what we have um, to, uh, to preserve the good elements and then uh, refine across time and uh, tweak it. Uh, because uh, uh, out, outright removing it is uh, almost never a good um, uh, tactic or at least almost ever has a, has a good result. Uh, just look at the many revolutions um, of history and, and, and you'll see that not many of them work out so well. It's pretty rare. Uh, so <clears throat> let's see here. England. The roots for this are actually go back quite a ways. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll title this, I guess, English Alternatives <clears throat> to Absolutism. So keep in mind that's where the monarch is increasingly uh, taking power away from the nobility and um, how do I can phrase this? Focusing control uh, to that monarch and then he can use power as he wants or she wants. Um, uh, in the case of queens, obviously, where uh, the nobles kind of have to take a take a seat, um, or at least a back seat, uh, to the uh, the monarch who's who's driving. Uh, so the roots actually go back quite a bit. Um, I, I would say even in the 11th and 12th century, you already had some signs of this. Um, but we're gonna because they do have some agreements with the monarch where there's certain things he can't do. Like the monarch would have like a council basically of what are now, we know as nobles, barons, uh, and some uh, clergy too, because that was back before the Reformation and it was all Catholics. <clears throat> he had these councils where uh, they would advise him on what to do for finances and how to collect taxes and make new laws. Um, and that was kind of because, you know, the Norman king came over from France and invaded in, uh, in 1066. The first couple centuries, they were kind of figuring out how to uh, manage this new identity uh, of a nation that they had there in England and then with the Angevinian Empire over here as well. <clears throat> so we, they, uh, they depended on the advice of others, and that kind of became a, uh, an unofficial approach. So that in the, in the 1200s, the 13th century, so I should say, uh, uh, King uh, used royal council advice. Council advice. Uh, for laws and taxes. Um, he again was still the one that was in charge, but he did seek their, their consult and uh, they were a part of these new taxes and laws and schemes. They had some input uh, as far as applying them. So that when the uh, 13th century comes along, um, we have a, a, a shift here. So in the 13th century, uh, the kings of England are becoming more <clears throat> accustomed to the way things go, and um, they're going to start 
ignoring this this sort of council approach <clears throat> where they neglect to uh, uh, consent them for new uh, laws or, or taxes and they start doing things that the, the nobility or the clergy actually disagree with. So they actually fight over this, uh, technically. Uh, they have a couple wars, but one of them is called the Barons' War, where the barons obviously rebel against the king for his tax collection policies and his failed um, uh, efforts across the, the, uh, uh, the English Channel in France. So they actually uh, rebel, and they technically fight a war, uh, and they win this war, and they force the king, well, yeah, force the king to sign a document, which you may have heard of, it's referred to as the Magna Carta. Uh, and this thing's going to be uh, signed and approved in 1215. Now, it's not going to be... Uh, <clears throat> how can I phrase this? It's not going to be precisely followed by the monarch. Uh, he's essentially going to argue that he was forced to sign this against his will and uh, try to ignore it. And several other kings, so King John's the first one, uh, which, by the way, uh, is the one from Robin Hood, if you guys have ever seen that one with... Uh, uh, like the with the Disney version with all the animals in it, that'd be King John um, or Prince John in this case. So, anyways, <clears throat> King John is uh, abusing his his authority uh, by overtaxing them and and, and using um, his his legal counsels uh, to to extract money and, and imprison people that are resisting in any way. So uh, the nobles don't like this; they fight the war over it. Uh, so he signs this, but he doesn't really enjoy this obviously he believes he should be in charge and he was forced to sign these documents so uh he actually gets uh permission to consent later not him but another monarch I maybe mean, it was him regardless who it was they actually have the pope who again at the time was still quite influential uh said that he didn't have to uh he issued a statement saying that that was a void contract because it was he was bullied into it didn't have to to listen to it so they fight over this multiple times uh but uh, it does stick to some degree. So again, they, they, they establish it in 1215, and then in 1217, they fight over it, reestablish it. In 1225, they reestablish it as well. Uh, and then, not that this one was due to conflict, but uh, they also reestablish it in 1297. So it's going to be firmly codified, at least in the 13th century, uh, after several disputes and, and resubmissions. But here are some things that they force the monarch to recognize. Uh, and these are... These aren't the first limitations ever on a king, but these are the first ones to be, be issued and actually stick across the centuries. There's going to be uh, times and monarchs that kind of ignore them. It's going to sort of depend on how powerful the monarch is uh, compared to the nobility. But uh, the English are going to reference back to this years later when the king becomes increasingly absolutist. So some things that they uh, require this king to do, and these are actually pretty major things. Um, I should mention, by the way, that these are uh, exclusive, exclusive, uh, to put the protections anyway, protections uh, for the barons, the nobility, uh, and the clergy. But uh, during these meetings, it's not just going to be the nobles and not just the uh, clergy, and this is going to be important for later. Uh, they're going to include regular common folk. Uh, so when they have these, these councils and meetings um, for the Magna Carta and, and going forward, it's not just nobility and clergy, even though it does protect them mostly. Uh, they're going to bring regular common folk in uh, to, to be a part of this sitting uh, and, and voice some concerns potentially. So uh, you get, again, the nobles and clergy are obviously there. But you also have the inclusion of, uh, it was like two knights per district or something like that. So they're not non-nobles. Uh, plus representatives from the boroughs, which is just a name for like a district. Uh, so these are regular people. These are like uh, gentry, like landed gentry. They're still wealthy, but they're not nobles. They're not knights, uh, and they are included in this, and that's going to be important, like I said later. So knights and, um, how can I phrase this, non-noble gentry. And this is a major part of that slowly beginning uh, enclosure process. So it's, it's very slow, like I mentioned before. Uh, beginning here in the in the 12th and 13th century, uh, how they are uh, uh, slowly beginning uh, to sell private land. So uh, land that's not rented or owned by the king as a as a fief, but rather it's actually just granted to them, uh, whether they acquired some money by by trade or manufacturing or whatever as a banker. I don't know the details on every individual person, but. Those individuals that were able to acquire money on their own, even though they weren't nobility <clears throat> or knights, they were able to buy this land from the monarch or, or whoever uh, slowly across time. Uh, and they are invited, at least some representatives of those are invited as well. Uh, so it's nobles, clergy, and then regular people 
uh, that are going to form these councils, and they're going to require the king to sign this uh, Magna Carta uh, charter, which, by the way, I think meant like great charter freedoms or something like that, because um, it's actually Magna Carta Libertarium in, in Latin. But anyways, um, so it's the great charter of freedoms. Oh, I should put that here. Great charter of freedoms. So you can see this is not going to make the, the monarch happy. Here, here's just a few things that they grant them, and you'll probably um, recognize some of these that you, you see in our U.S. Constitution if you know anything about it. Uh, so first of all, this, this, there's a whole bunch. I'm only going to give a couple here. Um, there are some very modern type uh, reforms that they apply to this. So number one, they're going to require uh, consent uh, by council for new taxes. Because that was one thing King John was doing that uh, was going away from the way they had done things before, how you'd meet and discuss and then pass uh, new laws and, and tax collections. Uh, and they were tired of him doing it on his own, so they, they forced him to, and other kings, Henry and Edward, uh, to later on acknowledge that they had to uh, call this council uh, to pass uh, specifically new laws about taxation. Besides the ones that they already paid, it's, it's new taxes that they're worried about. So like those, those feudal dues for rent that they've already had, they're not talking about those. They're talking about new ones. Oh, I did put new taxes. Look at that. Okay. So they've got that. That's actually quite important. They're also going to add, uh, this one's actually very critical. And I mentioned this earlier. Before the, the church or the king um, or any local, local magistrate or, or sheriff, if they found or suspected you of being guilty, uh, they could imprison you just based on the, um, the royal, the king or his council saying that you're guilty. Like they could just go by their word and, and punish you for it. And even if they tried to find if you're guilty, they'd use those crazy tactics where they, you know, either sink or swim. And if you, you sink, you're, you're innocent. If you uh, float, you're guilty. Or they would burn you with, with an iron rod or a, if you stick your hand in boiling water and if you died from the wound, then you were guilty. But if you lived, you're innocent. Those, those terrible, terrible ways of determining uh, guilt or not. They actually uh, required a, uh, a, a, uh, a trial, a hasty trial, uh, but a, a trial, and this is basically uh, required a trial uh, for imprisonment or, or guilt, guilty conviction. Uh, and this is the, the right we know uh, as habeas corpus, which is a right to a trial. So the government can't just uh, imprison you without First of all, explaining it, uh, but they have to uh, give you a trial, grant you a trial, uh, and a relatively speedy one. Otherwise, they could just say, all right, we're putting you in prison for now because we're going to have the trial later, and they don't have the trial for like 30 years. Uh, so <clears throat> that's uh, one very, 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 very important one that they uh, are going to include. Because later when the king starts imprisoning people without those trials uh, or later evidence, uh, then they're going to uh, cite this and, and make it a... a reestablish it in English law, and then carry that over here uh, to the United States when they make uh, our US Constitution uh, and colonial governments. <clears throat> okay, uh, some other things they do. They're going to uh, establish the uh, common land protection. <clears throat> so this is a little anti-enclosure. In fact, it is anti-enclosure. Anti uh, they don't want the peasants becoming too upset by not allowing them to use like the king's forest and things like that for uh, for scavenging and hunting and, and uh, or, or, or allowing their, their cattle graze on it. So they're going to rebuff those. But again, this trend is going to increase over time. That becomes important later on when, when the king starts becoming more power hungry. Um, what are some other ones that I wanted to mention? Consent, require a trial for conviction, uh, habeas corpus. Uh, oh, they protect their inheritance. or nobles uh, protected. So the king can't like overcharge them or just uh, revoke a fief uh, upon the death of a, of a lord or lady. Uh, they're supposed to recognize, uh, or there's some sort of formal process to that where uh, I think they can still charge them a fee for passing it on, but they can't just, um, uh, you know, at their own whim, charge an exorbitant amount or, or uh, take it themselves. I forget the exact details on that, but they do specifically lay out how the inheritance is gonna work for, for nobles that pass on their uh, uh, lord tenant uh, fiefs to uh, their, their uh, children uh, or other extended family. And then the other one I was gonna talk about is, oh yeah, and then they uh, also protect the, uh, the church in England, church lands uh, and actions in England. So that's, that's very pro-clergy pro slash Catholic uh, church, but that's gonna change when Henry rolls along, we'll discuss the last one, and just kicks the Catholic church out 
Um, not for good, because he comes back with, with his daughter Mary, but then his other daughter is going to reaffirm uh, those changes. Um, it also has some laughable ones. like it, uh, th So these are obviously more on the progressive side uh, in favoring um, you know, regular people and rights and protections, limiting what the government uh, or the monarch can do in this case. But they also somehow have some hilarious ones like uh, they ban intermarriage between social classes. So that it's not all you know, positive progressive stuff, but there are some ideas that are going to be very important going forward in English common law and, and Western law. So that's going to be a major um, a factor. And in fact, this is going to develop too, this non-noble gentry and the, the, the common folk being involved. Uh, in the 1400s, they're going to establish two precedents. Uh, number one, that they're going to have actually two um, uh, chambers. They actually get the name, I can't remember if it was in the 1300s or the 1400s, but they actually start going by the name of, of Parliament, as we know it, uh, the English Parliament. And uh, at this point, they're going to have uh, two uh, houses, uh, an upper house and a lower house, where the upper house makes decisions and has opinions and councils, and then in another area are the common folk that are going to meet. So it's two houses. Uh, the upper is going to be a mix of the clergy and the nobility, and the lower, of course, is going to be the common folk. Uh, and I don't want to make you think like anyone could join. You pretty much had to be a wealthy landowner or a knight, which is usually what they were anyway. Um, but uh, you could join, join as a non-noble. So again, if you're some like middle class or, or you know, what, what is today middle class anyway, uh, moderately uh, wealthy or, you know, poor, anywhere in between, you're likely not going to this. You'd probably be a really wealthy landowner, but it was still possible. And over time, as England becomes more wealthy and later they connect with the new world and they become wealthy through trade and they reform some of their um, economic practices, this enclosure movement speeds up and we get more and more and more people in this chamber and more and more of these uh, wealthy gentry folk that eventually begin to outnumber and out uh, earn and outpower the, even the nobility and the king um, themselves. So that's important. But uh, another two things, one I forgot to mention up here, by the way, is a, uh, they had the petition, petition system. That's actually the 13th century, but... This is where, if I've got a grievance, like I think the king's doing something unfair, or the noble, my heir, or whatever, uh, and I'm a regular citizen, whether I'm a peasant or not, uh, I could actually send a letter, a petition, if I can write or read, or I can have somebody else do it, uh, to Parliament, and they can read it and then address the grievance to the king or pass a law to, to fix the issue, whatever it might be. So that's important because in this process, even though it's still in the, the, the feudal uh, uh, period, and uh, you, you, again, you don't have... Uh, many rights as a citizen, you're, you're pretty much limited to your social, in fact, they, they ban the marriage thing. But it's important that regular people actually have a voice, because this is very, very unique to England. Um, there are, of course, other governments where there's some degree of this, but in England it's going to be the most consistent and strongest. And in fact, it's just all it's going to do is grow uh, across the centuries going into the 15, 16, and 1700s uh, going forward. So yeah, regular people have a voice, uh, whether they're in the actual, um, well, it's non-nobles in the actual parliament, that again is meets with the king and, and helps uh, uh, form and pass laws with him. Uh, and then of course uh, they have the voice to send complaints and letters and petitions to parliament, which they can potentially look at or not look at, uh, and then address to the king or, or make their own laws for it. <clears throat> and by the 1500s when Henry comes along and he starts doing his old absolutist thing and uh, butchering the Catholic church, taking their lands and making himself the head of the church in England, um, they do actually officially form the uh, what is now um, well, now it's technically the, the, the United Kingdom's parliament, but just stay with me for a second. The English parliament's going to form what it, what it actually looks like now. Uh, these two houses have official names. We have the House of Lords and the House of Commons. All right. And then uh, I can't remember the terms. It's like the spiritual lords or something like that and the secular lords or something like that. I can't remember what it is, but... Uh, basically, it's the same composition. The, the holy or spiritual portion of the clergy, the bishops that the, well, now, after Henry the King chooses, uh, and then uh, the nobles and the House of Commons, of course, are going to be uh, those noble folk. Knights are going to be kind of out by the 1500s. I should put that, by the way, 1500s. Um, <clears throat> but we do have a lot more of these guys now by the 1500s. As this has been progressing through the, uh, the several hundred years, we've got a lot of regular people. So, uh, again, it's just going to be clergy plus nobles, and then the uh, commons will be regular folk. But again, still just mostly land, owning, wealthy, uh, non-nobles.
<clears throat> okay, the reason why we've done this whole uh, discussion that you probably don't care about, but nonetheless uh, is important uh, uh, to the development of our government and the rights that we enjoy, is uh, they're gonna remember these. Uh, even though, like I said, uh, throughout the centuries, it's gonna kind of depend on how powerful the monarch is or isn't. Like in the case of Henry, for the most part, um, he's gonna kind of do what he wants. Uh, he's gonna be one of those, those powerful kings that does sort of centralized authority, takes over the religion, uh, issues a lot of changes, and there's not much the nobles can do about it. Um, and then his daughter too, when she takes over, uh, England's just doing rather well under her. So she's gonna have quite a bit of authority and say, but when things start going wrong, that's when the monarch becomes less powerful and, and uh, anyone who's questioning them is gonna become um, uh, more empowered or, or powerful. Uh, and again, don't, don't think this is not happening in other countries too. We've got later revolts like the Fronde in France uh, where the nobles lose and the, the Catalan revolts in Spain where the nobles win uh, or, the, or the, the, the nobles win in Poland as well uh, versus the, uh, the Sigismund uh, dynasty, or I don't know if it's the dynasty, but Sigismund first and second. Um, so it's not always um, clear, but um, here in England you've got regular folks increasingly in, uh, involved uh, and they've got a lot of old centuries-long documents and traditions to point back to if the king is, uh, I guess you would say, misbehaving. So, it actually comes to that at one point, and this again is where we really separate England from the rest, because, um, so, we kind of roughly talked about the developments. So keep in mind, we do have House of Lords, House of Commons, and there are some precedents to, to, uh, to cite from previous decades, because as Absolutum becomes more popular, and Henry and his daughters, especially Elizabeth, um, are going to sort of embrace this uh, absolutist approach, and then their um, uh, the, the the next uh, line of monarchs, the Stuarts, with James the uh, first, they're going to really try to increase the monarch's power. But this is where England, especially when things start going badly for England, uh, the uh, Parliament is going to be the voice of opposition. And it's not just uh, the clergy or the nobles, which are uh, less powerful at this point uh, compared to other nobles in on the on the uh, in Europe. You've also got a large amount of very wealthy uh, and very uh, influential regular folk, too, uh, which are uh, the gentry. So this is all going to occur during an event called the English Civil War. It's really a series of conflicts, but it is quite significant for American history uh, and uh, as far as, and then uh, just basic, basic Western laws, English Civil War. <clears throat> That's to be 1642 to 1651. I'm not going to try to bore you with details. I want to try to give you a quick summary so you just kind of know the gist of it and why it's important. Um, so the monarch is going to be trying to continue that legacy that Henry and Elizabeth and his dad, his father James, uh, continued of increasing the monarch's power and, and embracing this divine right of kings. But this is where, again, I said England is not going to be doing quite as well. Um, they're going to do rather poorly in their wars against European powers on the continent. There's a 30 years war going on. We're not going to get into that. Uh, but Charles II, the king at the time, or Charles I, the king at the time. So Charles I. King. Okay. Uh, he's going to be rather unpopular because of uh, some of his policies. He tries to uh, enforce uh, religious changes on Scotland, which is technically a second kingdom at the time. But... Um, He's ruling over both England and Scotland as king. Um, he's going to try to force some um, religious changes on them, and they're going to resist and actually defeat him. Uh, and he's going to be forced to uh, have to call on um, Parliament for, for more money and help and aid. And they're going to say no, because he's done rather poorly uh, with his wars across the English Channel, and he's also doing poorly against uh, Scotland. So they basically think, hey, you're a failure, or at least you're not doing well. We're not going to just give you money. Um, we're gonna we're gonna have a say in it, and they brought this up before. I think it was in 1920 or 1629 uh, when they tried to limit or control what what Charles was doing because they noticed the the the, the budget for the country was was awful. Um, they're gonna try to limit what he can do uh, with this uh, bill called the Petition of Right. Uh, what he did was he basically ignored it, dismissed Parliament, told them all to go home, uh, and he arrested several members. Um, at least one of them died actually in captivity. He was held for so long. Uh, so Parliament was pissed about this uh, because they were not given their uh, right uh, that's been guaranteed to them. And they really started citing a lot of these old documents like the Magna Carta and the changes that they had uh, made and been denied. So uh, he just basically tries to rule without Parliament uh, because back then the king had to summon them for the most part. 
Um, and then uh, he just tried to rule without them for 11 years, but it went really badly for him, and he'd ask for money uh, by the time 1640 came along. Um, and that's when Parliament started basically saying no. Uh, they would meet, uh, he would get mad about them for not giving them the money he wanted, and then dismiss them. And then they met again, uh, and when they tried to uh, force some changes on him, he tried doing the same thing he did in 1629, except this time it's not going to work out for him. Uh, so in, uh, I can't remember 1641 or 42, uh, he's going to arrest, or attempt to arrest, I should say, attempts, arrest of uh, parliament members. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember the exact numbers. I want to say it was seven total. I know five of them for sure he was really after, uh, and they were not noble people. They were people from the House of Commons who he didn't think that um, the nobles would be too upset for him going after. He like went into the chamber when they were meeting, uh, and he demanded to know where like, these five guys were, and the, the speaker there basically said, I'm not going to tell you, um, and he was furious about that. But at that point, Parliament, and even the House of Lords, even though they weren't directly involved in that particular scuffle, um, that's when they're like, whoa, this guy's getting a little power hungry. He's trying to just you know, grab us and imprison us, and remove us for, for opposing him. Uh, and that is against our laws and traditions here in England. Uh, so that is actually when tensions formed between uh, the uh, uh, House of Commons specifically, including some lords, uh, and the king. And uh, the king was outnumbered, at least in London at the time, quite a bit um, in the, uh, the, the gentry class was quite wealthy at this point. So he actually panicked and bailed on London uh, and tried to form up some uh, support for his monarch, uh, monarchical cause. Uh, and Parliament, of course, formed their own forces. Uh, and after a series of fights, there's actually three of them technically, <clears throat> uh, he loses the first two. And after the first one, they try to just hold him and get him to negotiate uh, these changes. Uh, and then he tries to uh, uh, organize um, uh, an attack from Scotland on them, and they find out about it, and they beat the Scottish uh, rebellion, and then they execute him as a as a, as a, as, a, as, as a treasonous uh, member of society. So by uh, was it forty nine? He got executed or forty six. Regardless, we'll just know he uh, Charles the first is going to be executed, which is unprecedented, by the way, in uh, European and English history. Kings have been captured before, and they would always, you know, sort of force them to. Uh, <clears throat> It would force them to uh, make changes, but they wouldn't kill them uh, because that was just not how they did things, uh, and it would, would possibly destabilize the society. But since they captured him and tried to make him uh, convert these changes, and he didn't, and he tried to, of course, arrange this uh, second civil war to overthrow them, uh, they actually uh, did end up executing him. And they tried to live without a king for a while. Uh, his son, of course, was out of the country and uh, tried to uh, take the throne back and, and failed. Um, and the Parliament did a couple things that were actually quite important. They passed a document uh, referred to as the, uh, what is it called? I forget the actual name of it. It's like the um, document or instrument of government, that's what it's called. Uh, and that's kind of, uh, you can definitely consider this a constitution since it's like a, a written document that limits the powers of the, the government and the monarch. But this one's a, a very, it doesn't last because England is very uncomfortable without a king uh, when they try to rule with just a parliament alone. In fact, they actually invite his son back later uh, as long as he promises to, be a, to behave essentially and agree to some of these changes. Um, but they pass this document, which is again, not gonna really last long in England in that decade or that, that period, but uh, it does establish some ideas that are going to be borrowed later uh, by the United States. So a couple things that it, it's gonna establish is number one, it's gonna form an official constitutional government and a constitution, which we'll talk more about uh, in, in the next novel pages, that's where you basically have a list of rules or procedures for the government that um, they're not allowed to uh, violate. Uh, and you could uh, have them impeached, which is basically just putting them on trial uh, and convicted, uh, and they could be punished for that, whether it's removal from office or imprisonment or, you know, in the case of Charles, I guess, they executed him. Uh, but yeah, it places a limit on what the monarch can do uh, in addition to some of the uh, prior limitations they had. So they had that. They also had uh, a new uh, idea referred to as the separation of powers. They decided that, hey, since, uh, since the king can kind of make and enforce his own laws, and they're supposed to uh, consult with parliament too, um, but they decide that maybe we should just have uh, those powers separated. Like the one who enforces the laws, like, you know, picks the judges and um, uses uh, physical force if he needs to, or, or, or the army, 
uh, to, uh, to enforce these laws. We should make the enforcement of laws separate from the making of the laws. So you can't just make your own laws and enforce them. Uh, you'd be enforcing laws that somebody else made. In this case, it would be uh, Parliament making the laws and then somebody else would actually enforce them. Uh, and the idea there is it's less easy for somebody to completely control uh, uh, the government at their own will and, and, and use it corruptly if they don't have all the power in their uh, actual um, uh, ability, within their uh, range of ability. So they, had that. they also had a, a new thing called, a uh, concept called checks and balances, uh, where um, the one who enforces the laws or the one who makes the laws actually have ways to potentially stop the other if they're acting uh, tyrannically uh, or they're, they're abusing their power. And they also implemented the idea of judicial review, where basically judges, parts of the legal system, can uh, decide whether or not a certain law or a certain action by the army or the police or sheriff or whoever uh, was um, appropriate or not, uh, if that was a crime or if the law was uh, violating some sort of um, constitutional protection in the Magna Carta uh, or in this instrument of government. Those are all relatively brand new innovative ideas uh, that are being pumped out of England or at least consolidated in England uh, by guys named uh, uh, like, uh, like Thomas Hobbes and um, John Locke. Uh, especially later. Uh, those are going to be um, some brand new ideas that 100 years later, the uh, colonists, when they break from England, are going to just straight borrow and apply to our constitution because we have all of these things. We have the separation of powers. Uh, we've got three different branches of government that all the different things. We have judicial review at the Supreme Court. We have checks and balances so all those branches can stop one another in one way or another or limit them. Uh, and we, of course, have a constitution that limits what we can do. So I don't want to say that, boom, this changed England forever because it didn't, at least at the time but it set the groundwork for um, successful ideas. Nonetheless, do know, since England is so used to having a king, they do, of course, uh, invite their king back uh, with a promise of good behavior, but it's not gonna be long, oh, my eraser is there. <clears throat> not gonna be long, though, before uh, they are going to have no more issues with the monarch. So uh, this will be the last section uh, we talk about. So this is after the same, uh, English Civil War. So 1660, they invite the monarch back, and things go somewhat back to, uh, to, to normal. However, things are going to change when uh, Charles II, the son of the executed guy, uh, uh, he passes on the throne uh, to um, James II. Uh, and James II, not the first, this is, guess what, this is what gets confusing, but James II uh, is going to be another monarch that England greatly dislikes. So... Uh, this is what's referred to as the Glorious Revolution. Uh, and it gets this name later uh, because there's almost no blood spilled uh, in this particular re uh, revolution. Normally, revolutions are bloody. You have some sort of armed conflict and a violent overthrow, and, and you have you know, this, this uh, deposition uh, era where, or, or, or phase where they try people for crimes or they try to hash out what the government is. There's a state of anarchy, perhaps, or there's a lot of executions and questionable activities going on. This doesn't have that. It's a pretty peaceful swap uh, of governments, or at least change in governments. So let's look at the roots. This is gonna be 1688 to 89. So it's not long after uh, though those English civil wars uh, occurred from 42 to 51, and, and Charles II had come back by uh, 1660. So first of all, you know this guy James II uh, is Catholic, and the parliament, which again is, uh, nobles and, and uh, um, clergy, House of Lords, and then the, the regular folk, which are increasingly powerful uh, uh, group. By the way, I forgot to mention the English Civil War. That was the group that sort of led the resistance and uh, ultimately and decisively defeated the king's forces. Uh, that gentry group at this point was incredibly strong, uh, especially if you combine them with, with some uh, cooperative nobility. So uh, James II, he's gonna be Catholic, and uh, uh, the people that don't like that are, are Parliament. Parliament is, uh, opposed to a Catholic monarch. And if you need a reminder, the reason why they don't like uh, Catholic monarchs is uh, because when Henry had taken the Catholic land and sold it off to people uh, and, and, and diverted some of those taxes, a lot of the uh, gentry and nobles that benefited from that, um, they don't want to go back, obviously. They don't want to go back to giving the land to uh, uh, the church or paying taxes uh, to Rome. So they're going to be pretty fiercely opposed to this. And at this point, it's been well over 100 years that they've had the Church of England established uh, and the Catholic Church has been out. Um, nonetheless, 
Normally, they would probably deny this, uh, uh, James II becoming a monarch, uh, because he's Catholic, but I think he comes in in 1685. Don't quote me, though, on that, but uh, he's king. And normally, they would oppose it, but they really didn't want to repeat of the Civil War, because even though the Parliament won and all that, it was like at least 10 years of just anarchy, death, chaos, and, and suffering for the English, and they did not want a repeat of that. They just invited the king back uh, not even 30 years ago, so they were willing to put up with this, uh, and they were actually okay with it because um, none of his kids were, uh, uh, were, were Catholic. I think he had only daughters, or only one daughter, and she was Protestant, so like, ah, oh, whatever. When he dies, uh, it'll be Protestant anyway. But in 1688, joke's on them, he had a, he, he had a son, despite um, having this long marriage without uh, any, any successful uh, uh, male heirs for a long time, uh, and they were like, uh-oh, He's going to make him Catholic, this, this new kid, this new son of his. So Parliament gets scared, and um, they get extra scared, too, when James starts doing some very questionable things, when he starts making laws where uh, Protestants uh, have limited use of weapons or confiscation, Catholics are, are armed. He starts replacing members of the government and the military with Catholic uh, supporters, um, and uh, that's going to be enough to make um, the Catholics very, sorry, the Parliament very suspicious uh, of him and, and want to get him removed. So what they're going to do is they're going to kind of arrange things. So what else is a post-Catholic monarch and then James II uh, passes uh, uh, decrees that are pro-Catholic uh, and starts adding uh, pro-Catholic uh, government and military personnel. So immediately Parliament uh, mostly the gentry, but um, uh, mostly, or but certainly members of parliament, including some of the clergy too, by the way. I think they're, they're called the Immortal Seven, the seven that went through this plot uh, and didn't end up getting killed for it. Um, they're going to arrange for the overthrow of James the uh, Second. So they're, what they're going to do is they're going to ask their buddy across the sea, well, not their buddy, uh, their, um, his daughter across the sea, who's married uh, the uh, ruler of, of the Netherlands, William of Orange, who's Protestant, they're going to encourage him to uh, invade England to take the throne. Because she was going to get it anyway, because she was the daughter of, uh, of James II. So they're going to arrange for um, this invasion with this guy, uh, William of Orange. He's Dutch, and he's Protestant. And again, he was going to get it with his uh, wife anyway, because that was James' daughter. Uh, but when the son was born, all of a sudden he had a, a good motivation to go in and fight. So he didn't want to go, though, if he thought they would actually resist him. So what they're going to do is in uh, 1688, they're going to arrange uh, for an invasion by William of Orange from the Netherlands. And again, he's got a force of like, was like 14,000 or something like that men, and they're, they're highly trained men. But King James II had an army of 30,000, and he had home field advantage. So an invasion without um, support from Parliament would have been disastrous. But if he knows that some of the nobles uh, or the gentry are going to uh, pull their forces out of James's army and support him, uh, and so basically take from the 30,000 James has and add to his 14,000, if it's a su substantial amount, then he's good, and he does secure that. Uh, so they're going to uh, promise uh, support for uh, William, who again, remember, he's Protestant and married to James II's daughter, Mary II, I think. Uh, and they promise to support him. So sure enough, uh, they go through with it after he agrees uh, and forms arrangements with these uh, with these uh, Parliament members and these uh, well, these Parliament members. And uh, what's going to happen here is uh, Parliament uh, is going to successfully. scare James II out of uh, England. Uh, I think out of the 30,000 he had, I think 26,000 deserted. Uh, either just stopped and left, uh, not in support of him, or joined uh, William's forces. Uh, so I'll put that here. 30,000 soldiers uh, defected. Defected. Uh, and it goes down to about 4,000. Which is nothing. So if you add some of those uh, to William's forces, which is already much higher uh, than 4,000, James II basically um, sees the signs, and uh, he, he's, he's granted the permission to leave by the Dutch. Uh, so they, they would rather do this without a conflict. Uh, so he exits for France. He's out. William is in. And part of the arrangement was that William would accept some limitations. 
Uh, and so Parliament's going to pass a series of laws. Parliament passes uh, what's called the English Bill of Rights in 19, or 1689. And this one's huge because this is going to uh, be one of the things that the colonists are going to cite going forward. Um, this is going to put a lot of limits on the monarch. And of course, they passed these laws. And, in, and, and part of the uh, agreement, at least at later on, was that William accept these. Uh, first of all, that he's going to rule with uh, James II's daughter, uh, Mary II, who is um, Protestant, uh, and then he, the Dutch uh, ruler, who's also Protestant. They're going to rule together, but also he's going to have a whole bunch of new limitations that he has to recognize. And at this point, with Parliament winning in the English Civil War a few years back, and, and now this glorious revolution, which didn't even actually have any fighting, at least yet, um, it's going to really demonstrate that Parliament is the one that holds the power in England, not the monarch. Now, they, they want to have a monarch, they want to cooperate, but the monarch has to cooperate. There's even actually technically a little subservient to the parliament uh, because they have successfully uh, defeated the king's uh, ambitions or at least quelled them uh, in the past, in the recent past. So at this point, it's not a question of, oh, maybe the king can ignore them. No, this is going to change the story in England where uh, the parliament, increasingly non-noble peoples, those gentry, uh, have the authority in England. And that's going to, of course, pass on into the colonies. Who are used to being involved in the government, having a say, um, so that you know when when the when the English king or, or the English uh, state tries to uh, impose things on them without their consent, without their involvement, doesn't treat them like regular citizens, even though they are, they're going to be like, hey, we have a whole history of of, of you guys um, recognizing people as citizens and involving them. Uh, so if you're not going to do that, then we're out. And they actually do. It's the uh, Revolutionary War was all about. So. Here's the things that they add. This isn't all of them, but it's uh, some of the more important ones. Uh, Parliament now, and this had been arranged before, but now it's going to be solidified and, and no longer broken just because the monarch is powerful and wants to ignore it. Uh, Parliament is now going to meet frequently, uh, and they don't need the king's permission to uh, form. So Parliament's now a permanent part of the government. Um, he can't stop them uh, or their meetings. Also, because it's been a problem in the past where parliamentary members who criticize the king potentially are arrested or persecuted, they're going to actually specifically protect freedom of speech, not for everybody yet, uh, but for uh, members of parliament. So free speech in parliament. And obviously that's going to be an incredibly um, revolutionary idea that's going to lead to the Enlightenment uh, in France, because the French are going to see a lot of this stuff going on. They're going to notice how well English is about to start doing in the world, uh, how they were almost an ignorable power uh, compared to uh, Spain or France or even some of the empires in the central uh, parts of, of, of uh, Europe. But they're going to notice that this new system of operation in England with this gentry class doing well and these limitations, England's going to kind of become the number one world power. And France is going to notice, uh, and they're going to adopt some of these ideas. And then, of course, it's going to also um, um, bleed into the United States, or, or what will become the United States. Uh, so they're going to like some of these ideas. And free speech is a big one. The ability to criticize people uh, to try to find a better uh, alternative instead of just silencing yourself because you don't want to be punished that way. Uh, if you're doing that, then the new ideas don't get, be, get to be discussed and, and, and formed. So free speech in Parliament, they also implement, what else do they implement? Some important ones. They're going to reaffirm a lot of those Magna Carta um, uh, type policies, uh, but they're also going to, oh, allow for free elections. So now the king or nobles can't interfere with who's running for parliament, like they can't charge them for it or have them removed. If they're elected, they can be elected uh, by their own means. Now, you're obviously gonna have to have some money to campaign to get your name out there, uh, but they're not gonna charge you for it uh, as, a, as opposed to uh, back when it, you, know, you may have had to uh, uh, solidify your position through some sort of purchase or some sort of uh, mechanism that, that required money to do that. So um, free elections are gonna be allowed. Parliament gets uh, me frequently. They have free speech in Parliament. Um, what else was I going to talk about? Um, oh, they get rid of uh, excessive fines. That was one thing that the king was doing to, to uh, get more money, even though their uh, Parliament didn't meet to allow him taxes. He basically just um, accused people of laws um, or, or charged them ridiculous amounts for um, potential legal violations. Uh, or uh, renewing uh, their titles or, or inheriting their land. So he would uh, basically just charge a bunch of money to, to make money that way. They're going to uh, ban that practice. And um, what else? I think there's at least one more I really wanted to talk about. 
Oh, this one's not new, but they're going to reaffirm the requirement for parliamentary consent for new laws and taxes. And again, that one goes all the way back to the Magna Carta, but that had been ignored by several monarchs, and now they're going to reaffirm it uh, permanently. And this is, by the way, still a part of the English Constitution, which isn't one document, it's actually a bunch of you know, documents put together over the centuries. Uh, but this is the uh, one of the foundational ones that's still in practice. They've changed some things, obviously, but um, many of these uh, are still around. And again, this is going to be the end of uh, kings directly opposing, trying to remove parliament members, trying to stop their uh, laws. Um, I think 1707 was the last time a king actually tried to stop a law, uh, like veto it. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, this is going to be recognized from now on. So some of these, again, we recognize from earlier times, but this is when Parliament really asserts itself uh, and it's going to establish this. And these are going to profoundly influence, if we were talking about AP Euro, which we're not, uh, profoundly influence the French to again see the success of England. Uh, that's going to shortly follow this period uh, after 1689. Uh, they're going to see the rise of England and, and, and start adopting some of their ideas on economics and government. But it's really going to affect uh, the, the um, uh, British colonies, which by the way, by 1689, are already underway. We already have, I don't have the US up here, but we've already got a lot of those foundational um, colonies like uh, 16 nights, we've already got most of those New England colonies are already in there. Um, you know, Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts Bay, which is Plymouth. Um, you've got the middle colonies with like uh, New York. Um, it, it, I don't, have they been taken by the Dutch yet? I can't remember if they've been taken from the Dutch yet, but um, New York area is either settled or about to be settled by the English. Are controlled by them. Pennsylvania, another middle colony, uh, and then some of those southern colonies uh, like Virginia, the big one, uh, and, the Car and Carolina before it becomes North and South. Um, those are already there. So these new ideas that are uh, created and asserted in England, those are going to, of course, make their way over to uh, the colonies, and they're going to expect also to be treated this way. So if the people in England are citizens, which they are, and they have these rights and freedoms and in Parliament, and they get representation, like you can petition to Parliament and you can run for it, um, they see that as a, as a natural right of citizens. So when the crown, the, the monarch, or, or even parliaments tries to deny colonists that, even though they are British citizens, they're like, hey, that's part of our, um, our system here. You have to treat us these ways equally, and if you don't, then uh, we're going we're gonna to bail. And that's exactly what they decide to do. So uh, that is the long, 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 long explanation about how um, law here in the West uh, shaped itself ultimately led to these uh, tyrannical, absolutist monarchs controlling everything. But uniquely in England, we have successful resistance to that and a lot of limitations placed, which we're going to apply and adopt uh, in the colonies and then in the formation of our government um, with the uh, um, Declaration of Independence, Articles of Confederation, and then the U.S. Constitution.